Good afternoon, those of you in the East Coast and uh, in the afternoon part of the day. Uh, this is Robert Elliott. My, my great, very pleasant duty to um, and uh, pleasure to welcome you all to this second talk in PDF's seventh year of what we call the PD Expert Briefings. Our topic today is cognitive issues, advice for Parkinson's care partners, uh, immensely important topic, and uh, I understand we have a very uh, rich audience um, uh, signed up for this, with close to 1,000 people, uh, which is an indication of just how important it is to people and their families. Um, just on a slight personal note, my own stepfather had Parkinson's um, 35 years ago now. Uh, my mother um, has his care partner, had nowhere to go for this kind of thing, and it's a mark of the um, seriousness and maturity of our community in Parkinson's in the United States that we now do have uh, uh, sessions like this for uh, the people who live with those they love with Parkinson's. Um, I want to, uh, to acknowledge a series of partners we have here. I'll spare you their long names, but tell you where they come from. PDF has made it its um, uh, business um, to, uh, uh, to involve uh, regional groups unaffiliated with any national Parkinson's groups. And I'm delighted that uh, our uh, co-sponsors among these regions include Dallas, Texas, uh, Houston, also Texas, the state of Michigan, uh, a new partner, Neuro Challenge Foundation for Parkinson's, the, the Carolinas, both north and south, the Rockies, uh, Denver and Colorado and points close, uh, the Parkinson's Association, and the Parkinson's Support Center of Kentuckiana. So we welcome them, and uh, thank you for um, giving us uh, at PDF uh, the kind of grassroots presence that um, keeps us honest and informed. Um, I particularly want to thank the uh, three corporate partners we have for this series, uh, names well-known to most of you on this call because they all make or are in the process of making uh, medications in Parkinson's that are very important to the million or so people who live with it here, uh, Abvi, Acadia Pharmaceuticals, and Lundbeck LLC. Thank you to Abvi. Thank you to Acadia. Thank you to Lundbeck for making this possible. Of course, we couldn't do it without the support, and we're very, very grateful to them. I think, as you all know, those of you who are regulars in the series, that um, our gratitude to these three great companies um, does not mean that we don't uh, that we don't have everything independently uh, designed. The content is entirely the responsibility of PDF, and not connected with any company's particular interests um, at all. So that's an important church-state relationship that we maintain. Um, I do want to tell you, those of you who uh, wish to know this that the PowerPoint slide deck can be downloaded from the reminder email you should have received this morning. Or, alternatively, you can go to the PDF webpage, www.pdf.org, and you can find it there. Um, one other piece of uh, public service announcement. Uh, for those of you who are qualifying health professionals seeking uh, continuing education uh, units for, for the experience this afternoon, um, you are entitled to receive one free CEU through the, our partners here, the American Society on Aging, which confers credit uh, not just on doctors and others, but also uh, several kinds of health professions. And we're very pleased to be part of this so that we can extend to social workers, um, nurses, and others uh, the credit for, the, uh, for the, uh, attending the course. Um, if you did register as a health professional, you indicated you'd like to use, you'll receive an email by the end of the day with steps on how you can collect it. Um, you have just 30 days until December 10, December 10 of this year, to collect your CEU. So please, if you wish to, take advantage of that. Um, so it's my great pleasure now to introduce our um, uh, our speaker for today, Dr. Rebecca Gilbert. She's the kind of doctor who has both the MD and the PhD, the clinic and the lab together, uh, and she is an assistant professor of neurology and also Associate Director of Education at the New York University Langone Parkinson's and Movement Disorders Center in New York City, one of the leading centers for Parkinson's disorders in the country, and one that, um, as most of you will know, has a very distinct um, attribute 
of being deeply concerned and interested in the in the care issues of Parkinson's, and they've organized themselves to do this in a very special way. They're interested in the medicine and the science. They also do uh, the, uh, the uh, expertise in how one lives with Parkinson's successfully. Um, I'll just give you a very a smidgen of the introduction to her besides the title. She's involved in, in a variety of research studies in Parkinson's, not surprising, major uh, research university. Um, she received her MD from Weill Medical College of Cornell University, uh, the best place in the world. My daughter happened to also get her MD from there. And her doctorate in cell biology and genetics at the Sloan Kettering Institute. She completed her residency in neurology and subsequently a fellowship in movement disorders at the Columbia University Medical Center, where she was part of a program which I'm proud to say the Parkinson's Disease Foundation has been funding for, I don't know, 40 years, 50 years, and some of the mo most important uh, neurologists and scientists um, in, in Parkinson's uh, passed through that program of 130 to date. It's a very, very important world resource. Um, so I will spare you any more details. There are plenty more I could talk about. She's a very distinguished person. We're delighted that she's joining us today. And um, the floor will be hers. Uh, bear in mind that about half an hour uh, when she completes the slides, we will be opening us up to um, questions. So if you wish to ask any, you can start them coming uh, whenever you like. Um, and uh, my two associates here uh, we'll be uh, making notes on these, and we'll try and combine them and make them um, uh, so that the uh, the, uh, the the Q&A session can be as, as uh, efficient as possible. Uh, Dr. Gilbert, thank you very, very much for joining us and honoring us with your presence. We look forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction and for inviting me to participate in this uh, very uh, special lecture series. Uh, my topic, um, as uh, has already been mentioned, is cognitive issues, advice for Parkinson's care partners. And what I hope to do today is present uh, some key elements, or at least the key elements from my viewpoint, uh, that may help uh, somebody who is a Parkinson's care partner uh, learn a little bit about the specific cognitive issues that are important in the lives of people with Parkinson's disease, and then hope to give some indication of how to deal with those particular issues. So we'll start by looking um, into why cognitive issues are a part of Parkinson's disease at all. We'll then try to understand the different types of cognitive issues, the specific domains of cognition that are affected in Parkinson's disease. We'll look at what a Parkinson's care partner can do to look at their entire partner's medical uh, existence and see if there are other causes that may contribute to cognitive issues. And then we'll turn to actual uh, ways to improve cognition as well as ways to understand the uh, an element of the cognitive problems, uh, namely psychosis and visual hallucinations. And we'll end up by giving some specific ideas about how to improve both uh, the uh, quality of life of the par Parkinson's care partner as well as the quality of life of the Parkinson's, uh, person with Parkinson's themselves in, in the domain of, of cognition. So let's begin. Why are there cognitive changes in Parkinson's disease? So as everybody listening knows, uh, Parkinson's disease for many years was known as a movement disorder only, as a disease that affected a, a person's movement. It made a person slow, stiff, maybe had some tremor, and had trouble with balance. Um, and the reason that those particular movement elements happened, uh, that we now know, is because of an abnormal accumulation of a protein called alpha-synuclein into abnormal uh, globules called Lewy bodies. I'm not sure you can see me pointing on the slide, but it's the pink amorphous body in the middle of the, um, of the neuron. And because of this abnormal accumulation, um, as I hypothesized, that is what caused um, cell death in particular areas of the brain. And it was known that uh, nerves that use the chemical dopamine were particularly affected by this process. But it turns out that brain locations all over the brain are affected by this abnormal process. So not only areas of the brain that affect movement are affected, but areas that control memory, that control attention perception, wakefulness, mood, all of them can have these abnormal accumulations. 
Now, another thing that everyone in the audience knows is that Parkinson's disease is, is an extremely varied condition. So whereas some people might have some of these problems, other people might have other problems or none of these problems. And so we understand this really, really large variability. But all these elements of the brain can be affected. Uh, just a little overview about what types of cog cognitive impairments uh, can be seen in Parkinson's disease. Um, but one of the key elements, again, is that this is a very, very varied process and a very, uh, there's a massive range of uh, cognitive impairments. Some people might have a very, very mild uh, amount of cognitive changes, and some people may have more than that. Um, and that's a major theme that I'll, I'll keep uh, getting back to. But all along that spectrum of cognitive changes, there can be improvements that can be made. Um, and so I hope that that becomes clear as I speak. So cognitive changes can be present at the very start of the illness. Um, they can start very mild and they can stay very mild, but those mild changes can be distressing. Another thing that's important to know, and many of you probably know, is that these changes in cognition may not be uh, the same every day or as, as the day fluctuates. Um, that could be because of medications, that could be for a whole host of reasons, um, but it is clear that cognitive symptoms can fluctuate. And just to be clear, Parkinson's disease, disease dementia is a subset of what I've been talking about, and that refers to cognitive issues that are more extensive and severe enough to interfere with independent function. And so that does not affect everyone with Parkinson's disease. That is only a subset of people with Parkinson's disease. Now, the cognitive domains that can be affected. Um, classically, uh, movement disorder or Parkinson's disease doctors like to talk about problems with executive function. Executive function is the um, ability of the brain to perform a multi-step task in order to reach a goal. An example would be following a recipe or programming an electronic device to do something. Uh, that can be affected in Parkinson's disease. Visual spatial function can be affected, and that would be the ability to see see things in 3D, to follow maps, to be able to uh, build something or to navigate around something. Um, other cognitive domains that can be affected are attention, language, and memory. And finally, one of uh, the particular cognitive domains that is specific to Parkinson's disease is processing speed. So uh, a person with Parkinson's may be able to come up with the right answer or be able to perform a function, but in a, in a slower way. Um, and so that is also something that a caregiver may notice and may have to adapt to. So I'm going to start um, the next uh, section of the talk by talking about something that's very, very important for Parkinson's care partners to know, and that is that there are a number of other causes that may be going on that may contribute negatively to a person's cognition. And all these things must be evaluated for in order to get the best cognitive outcome. Um, and this is something that all neurologists know about all patients, whatever disease they have, that all these elements may affect cognition and need to be evaluated. And it's specifically important for somebody with Parkinson's disease. And so the first on the list is uh, uh, low thyroid and low vitamin B12. These are two very easily checked uh, uh, elements in the blood. Um, and so as soon as um, cognition becomes an issue, it makes sense to take a trip to your primary care doctor for a physical and for basic blood work to see if there's anything obvious that can be corrected. Other uh, important things to know is that cognitive changes of any kind never worsen suddenly. So if there is a sudden worsening of cognitive symptoms or other symptoms, take your partner again to the primary care doctor for basic labs, specifically a, urinary, a urinalysis to make sure there's no urinary tract infection, and the primary care doctor may want to do a chest x-ray as well to make sure there's no pneumonia. So the top graph indicates that's how cognitive symptoms typically develop, very, very slowly over time. If there's a sudden, sudden change in cognitive symptoms, that's the time where you uh, you think there's something else going on. Let's take a look at the rest of the body to make sure that there isn't something else that's affecting cognition. Another huge uh, thing to uh, be concerned about in terms of cognitive issues are other medications that a patient may be on or persons with Parkinson's disease may be on that may adversely affect cognition. And one of the prime things to look out for are medications which, with what is called anticholinergic properties. These are medications that are used 
for all sorts of reasons. They are sometimes used for urinary problems. They can be used for depression, Cer only certain types of antidepressants. Most antidepressants do not have this property, but some of them do. Um, they can be used for cold symptoms. And sometimes a person with Parkinson's disease may be on an anticholinergic to actually treat their Parkinson's disease. And so this leads me to a very important point, which is that if a person has had Parkinson's disease for many years and was put on a medication early on, it could be, and didn't, and didn't have any symptoms from that, didn't have any negative symptoms from that early medication, it could be that as the disease progresses, that same medication begins to affect cognition where it did not earlier on. And so if cognitive issues are a problem, have your neurologist go through your medications and make sure that uh, there isn't anything obvious that can be uh, changed out for something else or removed to help with a cognitive problem. Other medications that may be uh, difficult uh, for cognition are steroids, uh, narcotics for pain, and benzodiazepines. The last one is probably going to raise a few alarm bells because many people uh, with Parkinson's disease are on benzodiazepines for anxiety and for sleep, um, and they may be necessary. Uh, and so this is a kind of risk-benefit analysis. Is the benzodiazepine helping um, anxiety and sleep, uh, or is it uh, causing uh, too much sedation, which may lead to cognitive issues. Benzodiazepines are, are medications like Ativan, Valium, um, Clonazepam, Xanax. Another huge modifiable cause in Parkinson's disease that Parkinson's care partners need to look out for is depression. Um, this affects up to 60% of patients with Parkinson's disease, and it is well known to neurologists of all stripes that depression can look like cognitive problems, and we have a word for that. It's called pseudo-dementia. There is a, uh, a name given to the state in which depression looks like dementia um, and, in fact, is not, is treatable with an antidepressant. And so if you have a situation where you have Parkinson's disease with depression, the depression can either mimic or exacerbate any cognitive issues. So it cannot be stressed enough um, to you know, bring a patient uh, with Parkinson's disease to their neurologist and really make sure that depression is adequate, adequately addressed and discussed. Um, this may be something that the person themselves are not fully aware of. This may be something that requires a care partner's intervention, um, and we definitely see that frequently. Another modifiable cause of cognition is sleepiness. Everybody knows that if they don't get a good night's sleep, they're not at their cognitive best the next day. Everybody knows that if you're taking the SATs, you want to go to sleep early the night before, and that's because a good night's sleep is going to get you a good brain the next day. And so Parkinson's disease patients, of course, are the same way. And unfortunately, people with Parkinson's disease can be afflicted with various types of sleep disorders, which make getting a good night's sleep very, very challenging. So some of the sleep disorders that can affect, affect somebody with Parkinson's disease includes sleep fragmentation, which means that the sleep is not, does not go from one stage to another smoothly, but that it's broken up and there's frequent awakenings during the night. Frank insomnia, where a person just doesn't fall asleep well to begin with. Obstructive sleep apnea, where a patient isn't able to oxygenate their brain well during the night. And, uh, and restless leg syndrome, where a person may feel that their legs are, um, are, are annoying sensations that keep them from going to sleep. And so all these things can interfere with getting a good night's sleep and feeling cognitively sharp. And in addition, beyond the problems with sleep, a person with Parkinson's um, medications can cause daytime sleepiness. And Parkinson's disease itself can cause daytime sleepiness, even in the presence of a good night's sleep. And so this is a huge uh, thing to address with your neurologist um, because daytime sleepiness can be uh, addressed trying to address the sleep to make sure that the sleep is as good as possible. Um, sleep disordered breathing or obstructive sleep apnea can be treated with CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure. Restless leg syndromes have a number of, of treatments. Um, and melatonin can sometimes be offered for disrupted sleep or frequent awakenings. And finally, if improving sleep does not lead to improvement in being sleepy during the day, uh, some neurologists will prescribe a stimulant, modafinil or armodafinil, also known as ProVigil or NuVigil, and that's something to discuss with your neurologist. The final modifiable cause that I'll be discussing is orthostatic hypotension, which is a drop in blood pressure upon standing, which can cause lightheadedness and can cause frank passing out. Um, cognition can be affected when blood pressure is low. If uh, a, a person stands up and they're not perfusing their brain adequately, well, uh, that's going to affect the entire brain and the ability of the entire brain to function, and so cognition can be affected in that, in that setting. And again, that is a modifiable cause that can be addressed 
um, by the neurologist with all sorts of uh, medical uh, drugs and non-pharmacologic uh, pharma methods such as maintaining hydration, pressure stockings, abdominal binder, slow changes in head position, as well as uh, uh, some medications to raise blood pressure if those are appropriate for uh, the person with Parkinson's disease. So all, this, all these uh, causes need to be assessed by the Parkinson's care partner, um, brought to the attention of the neurologist, and to, to maximize uh, the ability, the, the cognitive abilities. Um, but of course, we all know that with all these modifiable causes, often there is some underlying cognitive issues anyway. And so the question then is, what, are, what is available to treat um, the cognitive issues of Parkinson's disease. Um, so no talk today would be, no talk about Parkinson's today would be complete without mentioning exercise. Um, as everybody listening um, is well aware, exercise has uh, really been shown to be a fantastic addition uh, to our uh, the medications that we have available and in fact probably supersedes many of our medications and their ability to help people with Parkinson's disease. And there are many studies, in, in, innumerable studies, um, that quantify the um, effects of Parkinson's disease motor symptoms from exercise, how the exercise can improve the motor symptoms. And there are a number of trials that have focused on how exercise can improve cognition in Parkinson's disease. And this is just one recent example that I, I found um, from uh, a couple of months ago um, because uh, Invariably, if I mention to a patient, exercise is very important for cognition, the first question back is, what exercise should I do? What is the best exercise to do to help cognition in Parkinson's disease? And that question really we do not have an answer to yet since not every single type of exercise has been pitted against every other type of exercise in Parkinson's disease. We just don't know. But the good news is it looks like it sometimes doesn't seem to matter so much. Lots of different exercise programs seem to be beneficial. In this particular study, two exercise reg regimens were tried, one that emphasized stretching, balance, and breathing exercises, and the other that emphasized weightlifting and strength building, and both programs improved measures of attention and working memory. So what we typically tell patients is do what you are, uh, what you are going to do, and the Parkinson's care partner needs to understand this as well, that you, the you want to encourage your partner to do whatever exercise you think they will actually do. It's human nature to not uh, to not move if you're, you know, a body at rest tends to stay at rest. And so the Parkinson's care partner needs to, to encourage the exercise uh, that will be um, uh, embraced by the, the person with Parkinson's disease. So if a person with Parkinson's disease loves to swim, great, swimming it is. If a person with Parkinson's disease loves to uh, take long walks, then that's what you need to encourage. So that's um, usually what we stress. Um, in addition to uh, exercise, there are a number of trials out there looking at the benefit of cognitive rehabilitation programs in improving cognition in, per in persons with uh, Parkinson's disease. And in this recent example, um, this was a very extensive cognitive re rehabilitation program, which uh, was a 60-minute session three times a week for 13 weeks, covering all sorts of cognitive domains, including attention, memory, language, executive function, and social cognition. And that... Um, that uh, series of sessions showed improvements in multiple cognitive domains as well as functional disability. So whenever I talk about this, um, the, the question of the Parkinson's care partner is, okay, great, how do I get such a program established for my, my partner? And uh, that's, of course, difficult because uh, this is in the trial form. And uh, one day we may have this uh, standard of care of every patient with, with Parkinson's disease who has difficulty with cognition. We will enroll them in a cognitive rehabilitation program of this extent. Um, and right now, uh, that's uh, typically not available. Uh, what is available, however, is occupational therapy. That's uh, typically available in most uh, major medical centers. And most occupational therapy programs will do cognitive therapy. And so that is something to definitely look into as it can be quite effective to, uh, to help um, with these type of issues. What about medication? So there are medications that are available. Uh, they are unfortunately have a modest effect um, typically. Uh, the, uh, the one that has been best studied is rivastigmine, trade name is Exelon, uh, and that was studied specifically in people with Parkinson's disease in 2004, and it supports, uh, that study supported the use of rivastigmine for Parkinson's disease cognitive issues. Um, the, one of the downsides of rivastigmine is that in about 10% of people it can worsen tremor. 
there is less robust data for the use of other medications in the same class of rivastigmine, such as denapazil and galantamine, but those can be used also for people with Parkinson's disease. And there are some small trials for memantine or nemenza, which uh, have shown some mixed results, either that it was helpful or not helpful, basically, um, for uh, people with Parkinson's disease, but it's what we have available. And so both uh, nemenza and uh, rivastigmine and other medications like it are used uh, to help uh, people with Parkinson's disease. Again, the effects are modest. However, uh, some people have, have a, a, a a bigger effect than others. So sometimes you don't know until you try whether there's going to be an effect that's uh, kind of uh, robust enough to, to be worthwhile using. So uh, one of the uh, things that Parkinson's care partners are constantly looking for is what is the next therapy? Since we clearly have shown that the pharmacologic agents, at least, that we have available are weak. Um, so this can't be the final answer. We, we need to find other medications that are going to help with this very difficult problem. Um, so the first one that I have here, SIN120, is already in phase two trials, um, and it may help with dementia and psychosis and Parkinson's disease, and uh, we'll see about the data that uh, uh, develops from that. The second one, nilotinib, is, uh, has gotten a tremendous amount of press recently. Uh, and so I'll spend a moment talking about it. We uh, went kind of the day after the, uh, these results were released, uh, we got multiple calls from uh, patients and caregivers trying to get some more information about it. So this is a uh, specific enzyme inhibitor, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, that's already FDA approved for use in chronic myelogenous leukemia, which is a type of leukemia. The doses used for the chronic myelogenous leukemia are in doses of 600 to 800 milligrams daily. Um, and at those doses, what the, um, what the medication does is it forces the cancer cells into what's called autophagy, which is a pathway where the cell self-destructs, self which is, of course, good for a cancer cell. Um, at lower doses, um, about a third of the dose, um, it was hypothesized that the drug turns on this self-destructive pathway only briefly, allowing the cells to be cleared of the alpha-synuclein without actually self-destructing. And so that was the hypothesis, and it was tested in mouse models, um, and it was shown to decrease the levels of alpha-synuclein, so that was exciting. And then the medication was tried on 11 patients in a phase one trial, and it was not published yet. It was recently presented at the Society for Neuroscience meeting. And that's when the media picked up on this, uh, the encouraging results. And the results showed some dramatic improvements in motor and cognitive functioning. Um, this is, of course, exciting, but uh, we need to you know, have some very serious caveats, which is that it was only tried in 11 patients and there was no control arm. So there were no patients receiving placebo. Um, this is very important because placebo effects can be dramatic, which is a topic in and of itself. How do we cap capitalize on the fact that a placebo effect is, can help so much? But Regardless, if um, placebo helps a lot, then or taking a sugar pill helps a lot, then uh, we need to know what additional benefit the nilotinib would give. So we do need to pit the medication against uh, a, a control, and that was not done yet. Now the uh, designers of the trial are well aware of these um, limitations, um, are very excited about the results, and well aware of the limitations, and know that larger trials need to take place and are moving forward. So my advice to those listeners listening and to the Parkinson's care partners listening, um, keep your ear out for the larger trials that will come into uh, being probably in 2016. And uh, if you are uh, lo located next to a center that's going to be a trial center, consider joining. And that can be a really fantastic contribution because this medicine may be very effective. We just don't know yet. So I'll talk for brief, very briefly about Parkinson's disease and psychosis um, because this can be uh, a very, very troubling aspect of cognitive function uh, or cognitive dysfunction, uh, as the case may be. Um, so some co common features of uh, the psychosis specifically to Parkinson's disease are illusions or misper misperceptions that an inanimate object like a pillow is actually an animal, um, a false sense of presence uh, that these 
a person with Parkinson's may feel like someone is following them, but in fact they turn around and they see that no one's there. There can be frank hallucinations, seeing small animals, seeing babies, people passing through the field of vision, perhaps sitting at the dining room table. Usually the people are silent. Often the people are not uh, stressful, are not um, violent, uh, but sometimes they are, and these hallucinations can get very upsetting uh, sometimes. And there can be delusions, paranoia of infidelity or theft. Um, and so all those type kind of elements uh, are, are possible. And there is a huge range from very, very mild hallucinations that are not bothersome at all to extremely severe hallucinations that the patient uh, is hiding from or calling the police. So what do you do if this happens? So first and foremost, much like in the sudden cognitive change, if there is a sudden onset of psychosis, you must look for other medical illnesses, especially if it never happened before and this is a new phenomenon. Um, because certainly somebody who does not have psychosis, suddenly has psychosis, could easily have a urinary tract infection. You fix that and then the psychosis is gone. So certainly that's something to, to know about. Um, the other thing to consider is the person with Parkinson's may need lower Parkinson's disease medication. Um, because all Parkinson's disease medications can cause psychosis. And if insight is maintained, however, if the person with Parkinson's disease sees the hallucination, knows that it's a hallucination, and it doesn't bother them, medications can be left as is. So that's something to also know about. And sometimes a medication uh, such as quetiapine um, or, or clozarel um, can be uh, needed to control the psychosis as necessary. So now we're going to turn to the final part of the talk, which is, um, okay, so we, we know about the modifiable causes. We know about the things available now to help treat, treat the cognitive issues, and we know about things that may come in the near future. Um, but what does that leave us right now? What does that leave us with the remaining cognitive problems? The person with Parkinson's disease may be on all the correct medications, may be exercising, getting their cognitive stimulation. What, what do I do with what's left? Um, and so these are frequently asked questions that we get really, really frequently. Um, and I just want to talk briefly about these, these three elements. The first question that we get very frequently from Parkinson's care partners is, how much do I push my partner? So my partner has having difficulty programming her cell phone um, with, you know, alarming the cell phone, let's say. Should I just take the cell phone and do it for her? Or or should I, uh, you, know, uh, you know, make her do it? You know, is making her do it going to help her? Because I'm told if you don't use it, you lose it. So if I'm doing too much for her, then, um, you know, maybe that's working against the situation. So how much do I push? This is a great question, and I get asked it a lot. And um, there's, of course, no one answer. There's a lot of uh, variability among people with Parkinson's. So there uh, certainly can't be one answer. But one thing that you know I'd like to consider is um, you know the level of frustration that the partner is experiencing. So if the partner um, can do it, um, then then by all means let them. If there's a Building, building frustration and anxiety over the inability to do it, well, then um, perhaps that's the time to, to jump in. The other thing that uh, needs to be mentioned is if the task that's being asked, such as programming a cell phone, is uh, a multi-step task, one thing that a Parkinson's care partner can do is break down, write down the different steps in a very, very uh, uh, one uh, step, stepwise process and try to see if the Parkinson's p uh, person can follow the instruction if it is broken down like that in a very clear way. Um, but there's no, there's no one right answer there. It's certainly a challenge for many people. The second frequently asked question is, what if my partner does not know that he or she has a problem with thinking? There's an insight issue. So it's clear that there's been a deterioration in cognition, but the person with Parkinson's themselves either is not aware or is not admitting that there's a problem. That can be extremely frustrating for, for Parkinson's care partners um, because they just want to, you know, try to explain that there's, a, there's been a change, but uh, the person with Parkinson's is not acknowledging it. Now, the lack of acknowledgement can be a, uh, a mechanism, a kind of a denial mechanism that keeps the person functioning as, as best as possible that may be working in their favor to a certain degree. And so that is something you want to consider um, if the person's uh, trying to uh, maintain their, um, their self as much as possible and is therefore trying to deny these, these issues. Um, and that, and that is, is a, a tricky issue as well. When, when do you start talking about that, that denial and when do you start um, analyzing that denial? And that's a very tricky question. Um, so sometimes, uh, again, there's no one right answer here. Sometimes it's uh, 
make sense to uh, to go with with the patient and to to not necessarily bring up all the cognitive issues that you're noticing. Um, and sometimes it it is an important uh, time to bring it up. And when it is an important time to bring it up is if the patient is doing something dangerous. Um, the, the patient certainly cannot um, cook by themselves. Let's say. Um, for, for fear that there may be, they may cut themselves or may, or may burn themselves, um, that may be a time to, to intervene. Um, and beyond that, if they're trying to do something that is not harmful, then perhaps uh, you, you let them be. And so that can also be uh, very tricky to, to, um, to dance around. And the final frequently asked question is, how do I know if the Parkinson's patient or, or my partner can't do something or just doesn't want to try um, because, as we all know, apathy, which is kind of the just not caring or just not having any interest in things that the person used to have interest in, um, when is that rearing its ugly head versus simply are not able to anymore? Um, and that also can be very, very tricky. Um, apathy is a very, very diff difficult problem in Parkinson's disease and um, it needs to be uh, acknowledged um, and uh, sometimes nagging is required. So if if you don't know whether the person is not able to or is just apathetic, sometimes pushing the patient a little bit is what's necessary. But again, there's no right answer. Just wanted to acknowledge these very, very tricky uh, questions that Parkinson's care partners face. So let's talk on the last few minutes. Uh, let's talk about some lifestyle modifications for the Parkinson's care partner to try to uh, deal with the cognitive issues. So again, um, the, the cognitive issues that a particular care partner may be facing are very, very broad, from mild to, to very, very severe. Uh, but in all in all of that spectrum, um, the, the important elements are focused on your partner's abilities. Um, don't necessarily focus on everything they can't do. Find the thing they can do and try to focus on that. And so do activities together with your partner that you can both enjoy, whatever it may be, from, you know, dancing the tango to watching a movie, um, depending on where they lie. If you become frustrated yourself, and it's extremely reasonable to become frustrated in whatever state that your partner is in, take time for yourself. Find other people in your support network that can jump in and give yourself a, a little bit of time for yourself. Um, there are Parkinson's uh, care partner support groups that can be very, very helpful to not only brainstorm about ways to improve the situation, but to just express your frustration about the situation that you're in. And finally, there may be um, professionals that can help you get through the situation. It may be counseling, helping plan for the future, et cetera. So these are uh, very important to kind of validate what you're going through, um, acknowledge it as something that's really, really important to deal with, and then uh, deal with it uh, as best you can, give yourself the strength. For the person with Parkinson's disease themselves, um, the Parkinson's care partner can help them with these elements that can maximize uh, their, their, their co cognition. First of all, getting enough rest and eating a healthy diet. Um, healthy diet is, of course, difficult to pin down. What is the best diet for someone with Parkinson's disease? Not known, but a diet like a Mediterranean diet, which has a lot of fruits, vegetables, olive oil, and, and lean meats, um, has been, lean chicken, I should say, not so much red meat, um, has been associated with improved cognitive function. So that's uh, one kind of framework to work with in terms of diet. Um, do not multitask. I cannot emphasize this enough. A person with Parkinson's disease has difficulty multitasking, so just stay away from multitasking. Break down the task into small bits. Do one thing at a time, and that will increase the ability of success in whatever you're trying to do. Again, focus on your abilities. And then the triumvirate of keeping your mind active keeping your body active, and engaging socially. Those three elements keep a brain active. Um, the brain loves novelty. Try to learn something new, whatever it may be, um, from a new type of dance to a musical instrument, whatever you're capable of, um, and increasing your exercise and increasing your uh, socialization with others. Um, and just the, the last two slides are uh, specific strategies to improve executive function um, that can be tried with somebody with Parkinson's disease. Um, so if the, if the goal is, let's say, to clean out a closet, um, the, the goal seems massive. It's a really big closet. It's really dirty. We'll start with one shelf. Break the task down into very small sub-goals on the path to the larger goal and establish a schedule for uh, each shelf um, and, and make sure that the care partner is monitoring that progress. Okay, you have two days to do that shelf. Have you done that shelf? Let's go to the next shelf and make it into small bits that are much more uh, uh, definable. 
and remove temptations from the work area. Take away television, take away social media, um, and try to, to, get, to give that focus and that, uh, those small pieces. And then strategies to improve memory, write everything down, and while you're writing it down, say it out loud. Um, and that can uh, burn the piece of information into the brain a little bit more. Make to-do lists, cross off what's been accomplished. Try to stay uh, on top of the issue that you know that you have trouble with. Do not multitask, again, because if you're trying to, do, to remember something, you're on the phone taking down a message, and at the same time you're trying to check your email, it's not going to work. You're not going to check your email correctly, and you're not going to remember the message. Do one thing at a time. Your mind needs more time to remember, so just play to your strengths. Don't trip yourself up by doing things that your mind has difficulty doing. And if there's um, uh, something specific that you typically lose, like your keys or your wallet, make a special place. And the, the, that thing always stays in that place. Just make it easier on yourself. Make it easier to do the things that you know your body and your mind don't, don't necessarily do well on your own. Give yourself some extra, uh, you know, a, a leg up. Um, and on that note, I'm going to just uh, repeat the take-home messages to the talk. Um, so what you want to do, so we're talking now about cognitive issues and advice for Parkinson's care partners. Um, in summary, you want to talk with your doctor about treating any modifiable causes. You want to talk with your doctor about potentially trying on one of the medications for cognition. And then you want to work with your partner to stay physically, mentally, and socially active. And the most important part of probably the entire talk is making sure that you the caregiver's um, frustrations and um, a point of view is validated and that you take care of the caregiver. Thank you so much for listening. That's terrific. Thank you very, very much. That was wonderful, Dr. Gilbert. We're very, very grateful. I don't know about the rest of you on this call, but uh, I find myself struck when we're listening to a very fine talk like this, uh, how many of the um, suggestions that Dr. Gilbert and her colleagues make for people with Parkinson's actually <laughs> could very well apply to all the rest of us. Yes, and, indeed. Uh, <laughs> I, I certainly find you know, as far as about making lists, the, the dietary stuff. I mean, you've got a nice list. A number of the things that she was talking about that really we we could all use. So thank you very much. For I think that's an excellent point, which basically is, <laughs> is is stating that a person with Parkinson's disease who has cognitive issues is not that much different than anyone else with these cognitive issues, and so it it kind of normalizes the entire entire issue. Good. That's, I hadn't thought of that, but that's a perfect rejoinder on that point. Very, very good. Um, it won't surprise you that many of the questions we received in the last half hour have to do with, does this um, cause or exacerbate cognitive decline? Does that? Does the mm -hmm. other? So I'll go through these as a little group of things, if I may. Um, if you answered them, which you may have when I was um, writing something down, forgive us, uh, Dr. Gilbert, but let me try with these. Um, sure. Here's one. Does, do certain illnesses uh, uh, have a greater risk, uh, carry with them a greater risk of developing cognitive problems? Specifically, this, this person from New York is asking whether pneumonia might impact mm -hmm. cognition. Okay, and the answer is absolutely yes, um, in the, exactly the same way that a urinary tract infection um, can uh, worsen all the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, a pneumonia can do exactly the same thing. Um, so certainly if, uh, you know, I would say it's 50-50 whether uh, the, the problem is a pneumonia or, or a urinary tract infection if a, a patient uh, declines suddenly. So certainly if there's, you know, the, the primary care doctor can evaluate um, whether there's a pneumonia by listening to the chest. Um, um, if the primary care doctor feels that a chest X-ray is warranted, then, then absolutely, that's something to, uh, to to look for. Thank you. Um, here's another one, another another question of the same kind: uh, Is the, does stress play an important role in cognitive issues? Okay, that's a great question, and I could have put that on my frequently asked questions had I thought of it, because it is a frequently asked question. Um, so without a doubt, and again, this, this is something that may speak to you, Robin, as well, because if, you, if you're stressed, if somebody gives you a test, you know, and you, or a cognitive test specifically, you know, uh, remember these five things, and you're really, really nervous, you may, black, you may blank out. You know, you may just not remember any of them. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a, um, a feeling that we've all had. You know, your mouth goes dry, your, your mind just turns to a blank, and you have no idea. So in the moment, if you're very, very stressed about 
something, you may not be able to, to think clearly, and that's definitely true. Um, and this comes into play when we're sending people for uh, cognitive evaluations, um, and they're very, very, very nervous about the cognitive evaluation, and they don't do well. Uh, sometimes we don't know if it's just so stressed about the test or, or not. Um, I'm not sure that's exactly what the questioner was asking, though. Um, the questioner may have been asking if the person is, uh, um, has some stress in their life, will that uh, mean that they have cognitive problems? And if we get rid of the stress in their life, will their cognitive problems get better? And that's uh, possibly. I mean, it's certainly um, uh, if, if the stress can be eliminated and you can see, then that, that is, of course, the way to go. Um, some level of stress is, of course, can't be eliminated for whatever reason, um, and that's sometimes life, and so sometimes it's hard to know whether the stress is playing a role. But certainly in the moment, um, you know, if, if a person's stress can be relieved, then they typically do better on cognitive um, evaluations. Thank you. Uh, again, in the same line of things that may or may not uh, exacerbate cognitive problems, um, is there a link this person wants to know between DBS and cognitive impairment? And okay, if I can add just a bit of an yeah. additional piece of the same kind of question, it's my understanding that um, uh, cognitive impairment is considered a, uh, something that will um, disqualify uh, you if, yes. uh, if, from, from uh, DBS. And That's so exactly are, true. Are the, two, are the two points related? Yes. Um, so it's a great question, um, uh, and, and that is definitely true. It's, it's well known that um, a person who has underlying cognitive issues um, are uh, disqualified from getting uh, a DBS. And so everybody who's being evaluated for the surgery will have a full battery, a full neuropsych battery, to make sure that they, they fit within the normal range before the surgery. Um, there were concerns um, a number of years back that um, the actual surgery could contribute to cognitive issues because what you're basically doing is passing a wire uh, through the thinking part of the brain in order to get to the deeper structures. And if uh, you pass the wire the first time and didn't actually hit the correct target, you may have to try again. You may have had two passes through the thinking part of the brain. Um, and so in centers that maybe didn't have as much experience or um, weren't able to get the DBS placed correctly in the first passage, um, there was some concern that, that those multiple passes may uh, affect cognition in the long run. Um, if you go to uh, a good center with uh, modern equipment and, and good imaging, um, often they, they hit the target on the first pass, so that's not as much of a concern um, today. Um, the data is not clear, uh, however, whether um, a DBS in general versus cognition. It's not thought to. Um, it's thought if you have a good um, starting uh, neuropsych testing, um, then you, uh, you, will be, you will be in the clear in the long run. Thank you. And again, I think you didn't cover this one. I'm trying to ask you questions that you haven't already answered. Um, the matter of alcohol. Does alcohol okay, no, affect that. cognition? Okay, so... Um, if somebody drinks too much in the moment, it, again, this is true for every human being, they're going to have cloudy thinking. That's being drunk. That's a human condition that many people are familiar with. Um, and so your cognition is going to be impaired in the moment. So certainly alcohol, that uh, enough alcohol that um, makes you uh, uh, intoxicated is certainly going to affect your cognition in the moment. Um, if a person uh, it drinks alcohol excessively, uh, they can have permanent changes in their, their brain that affect uh, not only their thinking but their balance, for example. The, the cerebellum, the uh, balance part of the brain, is, is uniquely sensitive to alcohol. Um, and so for a number of reasons, it does not, uh, does not do well for a Parkinson's patient to drink excessively. The question is what is excessively and what is, um, you know, something, an amount of alcohol that may actually be healthy. There are certainly studies that, that show that, uh, you know, a glass of red wine a night is, is can be healthy for, for a person. Um, so probably more than one glass a night is perhaps going a little too far for somebody with Parkinson's disease, um, and certainly uh, any amount that uh, uh, is considered excessive would uh, kind of adversely affect cognition as well as balance. Thank you. Um, here's a, a person who's uh, a caregiver. She's identified herself as a caregiver. And she's asking if you could address the question of intermittent audio hallucinations and whether that means if the patient has those particular symptoms, would that make him or her uh, ineligible for, uh, for DBS surgery? 
uh, uh, audio hallucinations yes, was the it, question? Yes, uh, she describes it as intermissions. Audio hallucinations. Audio hallucinations. Um, so, uh, I mean, that, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, the audio hallucinations are much less common in Parkinson's disease than visual hallucinations. Um, so the question would be important to make sure there isn't another underlying issue that's causing the hallucinations. Um, certainly Parkinson's disease could be doing it, but you just want to um, – have a full assessment that there isn't something else going on since it's not the typical hallucination. Um, also, you'd want to make sure that there isn't, uh, that the person's on a good level of medication um, because if this is just too much medication, then pulling back on the medication may uh, relieve the problem and, um, and, and then, you know, it's as if the person never had the problem because it was all caused by the medication. Um, it, 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 the, in, in the in the let's see, a DBS centers um, is trying to, to to maximize their you know their their patient selection I should say. So a, a DBS center wants results to be good. They don't want uh, people to be coming back with cognitive issues, with falling, with the, the system not working to their benefit, without uh, you know giving them giving the person uh, you know any uh, advantages. The, the, a, a, a DBS center wants successes, and so um, it is certainly possible that if there are unexplained hallucinations, that that is, uh, you know, something that may uh, indicate that there may not be a good outcome, and a DBS center may shy away from doing it. I can't speak to the specific situation, but I can see why, if there's um, some doubt about why there are the hallucinations, um, and uh, it's not necessarily caused um, only by medications, that there may be some hesitation in proceeding. Very good. Thank you. Um, several of our questioners have been addressing uh, symptoms that they've noticed in the, the person who has the Parkinson's and are, are wondering whether these symptoms might be related to cognition questions, which obviously okay. are things that concern everybody. One of them from Colorado is asking whether anxiety is connected with uh, cognitive impairment or quite separate. And another the caregiver from North Carolina is asking um, about uh, wild dreams or acted out dreams or speaking and talking often uh, incoherently during sleep. Okay. Uh, either of these um, sort of moodish, uh, depressionish, uh, whatever they may be, uh, kinds of uh, symptoms connected with the cognitive part of what we're talking about in part. Got it. Okay. Um, we do think that both those issues are separate from cognition um, for the most part, um, whereas, let's say, apathy um, is considered uh, something that may be linked to cognition or may be a risk factor for cognitive decline. Um, depression and anxiety, less so. Um, we do think of depression and anxiety as sister or two heads of the, as a, two heads of the coin, two sides of a coin, um, and they seem to be very similar, treated in very similar ways. Um, but the centers for depression and anxiety do seem to be separate from the centers for cognition. And so I wouldn't necessarily jump to the conclusion that the anxiety is a, a symptom of cognition and can be treated treated, sometimes rather effectively, with an antidepressant medication. In terms of the dreaming, so vivid dreams are thought of as kind of the lowest level of visual hallucinations. Um, they're not really hallucinations since they're kind of a normal hallucination that many people have, or most people have during sleep, but a particularly vivid hallucination can be a result of Parkinson's disease medication. So it's often what happens. And so that would be something to talk with the neurologist about, often if the vivid dreams are very some, we will move the last dose of cinnamon a little earlier or carbidobolivodobol a little earlier to try to prevent some of that, that vivid dreams. Um, the, the other part of the question was, what about if the dreams are um, very active and they're calling out in their dreams or talking nonsensibly in their dreams? That's something else entirely. That's um, a condition known as REM behavior sleep disorder. Um, so the normal sleep processes is that a person is um, paralyzed during sleep. A normal person who's sleeping and dreaming um, is paralyzed during their dreams. And the reason for that is um, kind of evolutionarily is that uh, if you're uh, being, having a very active dream and you're, and you're able to move, then you can lash out, you can fall out of bed, um, you can hit your bed partner. Um, so a person with Parkinson's disease may have this um, kind of sub-disease called REM behavior sleep disorder where they um, hit their bed partner, they fall out of bed, they, they can cause trouble for the typically for the bed partner, um, and that is 
thought to be unrelated to cognitive decline. That's its own thing. Um, that uh, sometimes precedes the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, so a person may have that problem for many years and then develop Parkinson's disease, and some people have it unrelated to Parkinson's disease. Um, and so I would say to both those questions, not necessarily linked to cognition. Right. Sorry, I, I muted myself. Uh, Carl, <laughs> I, I knew your office happens a lot. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, the question, um, I should have spotted this one earlier. I don't believe you talked about Lewy body disease. Okay, yeah. And the question is, uh, a person is concerned as to whether this is the same as cognition, is it different, and uh, uh, there was levels of concern. What would you yeah. say to that? Right, so, so great question. Um, so I did show a picture of a Lewy body early on, So uh, which, which indicates that actually – Parkinson's disease, um, the, the pathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease itself is the Lewy body. So what the question is, is what about this other entity known as Lewy body dementia? What is that and how is it related to Parkinson's disease? Um, so what we think is going on in, in Lewy body dementia, well, let me start from the beginning. Um, a technically or clinically, a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia is made if dementia or cognitive trouble begins very early on in the course of the Parkinson's disease. Typically, the, the, the definition is within a year of motor symptoms. Either uh, the, the cognitive issues develop either before the motor symptoms or within a year of developing motor symptoms. So that's considered early on. And that um, is, is gives, gives the person kind of a unique title of diffuse Lewy body dementia. The question is whether practically it's actually a different disease or whether it's just where the Lewy bodies are in that particular person versus someone else. So whereas in Parkinson's disease, the Lewy bodies typically are um, predominantly in the midbrain where the, um, the centers for movement are, the Lewy bodies stay there for a long time, um, and then may progress to the thinking part of the brain. Um, in Lewy body dementia, the Lewy bodies are in the thinking part of the brain very early on. Um, the, the, the question is, is a little bit academic right now, whether they're kind of on a spectrum, they're, they're one disease but on a spectrum, or they're two separate diseases, because we don't have any specific medications for one versus the other. Um, the concern of the questioner, of course, is, well, um, you know, certainly – uh, if you fall into that category where the cognitive issues start early or before the motor symptoms, well, that carries a more um, uh, a, a worse prognosis for cognition overall and more likely to develop into frank dementia where the cognitive issues affect uh, daily functioning. Um, and so that definitely would be something to discuss with your particular neurologist if he or she feels that um, your, um, your partner falls within that rubric, which does unfortunately carry carry a slightly more um, difficult prognosis. Thank you very much. A uh, matter of driving always comes uh, up in these sessions yes. one kind or another, and sometimes we think that most of the uh, factor, the largest factor there is, is motoric, a matter of motor symptoms. Yes. Obviously, it could also be other symptoms. Absolutely. How, how important is um, the cognition question in connection with driving and that very special, often the hardest possible thing to uh, deal with, with a person with Parkinson's, how can that be addressed by the loving caregiver who obviously is often, I'm sure, frightened for his or her own Thank condition you. in, a, in the, the way that cars go? So yes. can you address yes. that? Yes, it's a fantastic question and something that we deal with all the time. Um, so again, this is not something that's specific to people with Parkinson's. It's certainly a problem for many, many people as they age. Um, driving requires all sorts of things to be correct, besides vision, uh, balance, um, cognition, uh, 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 response time, um, motor function. Um, and so a lot of these things tend to not be at their sharpest as people age. And so many people need to to uh, have their driving abilities reassessed as, as uh, people get over, older. And unfortunately, um, this is not addressed by our legislature, which is really where the question should be. There should be, in my opinion, um, a system by which people as they age get their driving tested. And so it takes the responsibility off the caregiver to stop a person from driving if they're dangerous. Unfortunately, that does not exist, at least in my state, um, and so it becomes the responsibility of the caregiver, which is, to me, quite unfortunate. 
And so um, what I, you know, what I say to people is, you know, I have a frank discussion with, with the patient, and I ask them, do you feel like you're driving a safe? And they may say absolutely yes, and the caregiver is nodding, you know, shaking their head in the corner. It's absolutely not. And if it's, if it's that type of situation where the caregiver really feels that the driving is, is unsafe and the person themselves does not see that and does not want to stop driving, I will refer to um, a drive for a driving evaluation. So this is a way of assessing driving in a very objective manner. Um, typically, it's done by an occupational therapist. We have a, 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 such a program in our center um, where the, the person either sits in front of a computer and does a simulation or gets into a car, actually, with somebody. And then uh, certain elements, specifically reaction time, can be tested to see if a person uh, seems to be safe or not. And that's an objective uh, test. And some people will pass it even if their caregiver thinks that they're unsafe, in which case I let them continue driving. But it gives the, uh, the, 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 the patient a little more control over the situation, that they're being tested by somebody um, objective and, and, and outside the family. Um, and sometimes if, uh, it, you know, it, sometimes what I say, you know, if it's clear that the patient is, is unsafe, let's say they've gotten into three accidents. This happens frequently, small accidents. They've, they've brushed against a tree once when they were parking or they bumped a bumper. You know, nothing major, but, you know, two or three times this has happened. Um, and so what I, I say is, this is my line, I say, um, you know, you've, you, you know you're, you're, you're 77 years old. You've lived a, a wonderful life. You have a wonderful family. You have a fantastic legacy. Do you want your legacy to be that you hurt somebody else. And that will be what you will be remembered for if something terrible happens. And so that's, I think, very true. I think it's very true. And, and, and nobody wants that. And so sometimes that's what it takes, um, you know, if, if necessary. That's a wonderful answer. My goodness, what a good answer. And as your reward, I have another, another difficult question for you. Okay. <laughs> um, we have a, a social worker from Oakland, California, who's um, uh, asking a question concerning uh, something you mentioned earlier, but um, I want to just to take it a step further. Paranoid thinking that comes mm -hmm. often with, um, with, with Parkinson's and that can actually um, uh, turn on the caregiver, which can be yeah. particularly tragic yeah. and poignant. Yeah. And uh, this person obviously is asking for the heart. She's the person who obviously deals with this, yeah. and she wants mm -hmm. to know what you would recommend if there are uh, strategies here to help with people who have persistent paranoid thinking about their very caregivers. caregivers. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, this happens a lot. I mean, everyone knows that, um, you know, in, in normal life, if you're you're going to get angry at someone, you're going to get angry at the person that's closest to you, and that's the person that's there. That's the person that you can um, vent frustrations at. And so, the same is true for somebody who might have uh, kind of delusional thinking. It's going to be targeted often toward the person that's closest to them, um, and it can be horrible, a horrible situation where the person's spending so much time helping their loved one, and then the loved one is is turning on them in this way. Um, and so what, what I would do is assess the paranoia much like I would assess visual hallucinations um, in terms of they're both uh, types of psychosis. Um, and the first thing, again, look for intercurrent illness if that's clearly not the case, which is probably not in this particular situation, is make sure that the person's on the least amount of Parkinson's medication possible. So what sometimes happens, unfortunately, as Parkinson's develops, and again, this is not everybody, this is only a small subset of people, is that um, the, the, a person's motor function deteriorates to the point that the medications are no longer as effective. So they may be on larger doses from an earlier time, um, and now the larger doses are not doing a, a, a lot for motor function, but all they're doing is causing the, the hallucinations. So you want to pull back on the um, on the Parkinson's medications as much as possible to try to maintain whatever motor function is there but not be causing unnecessary side effects. And sometimes that's very, very helpful. Um, if that isn't helpful enough or if you start pulling back on the medications and the person can no longer walk, whereas before they were walking with a walker and now they're not, so that's not good either. So then sometimes what you need to do is bring in a medication to control psychosis. Um, that can be tricky because the vast majority of medications that control psychosis are in the world that are used by psychiatrists are dopamine blockades, blocking agents. And so that isn't something you want to introduce to somebody who has Parkinson's, but already has a dopamine uh, deficiency. 
And so there are two uh, antipsychotics. Um, one is called quetiapine or Seroquel. The other is called clozapine or Clozaril. These are two antipsychotics that are, are safe to use in Parkinson's disease and can control the psychosis without um, interfering with motor function. And so those are the medications um, to use. The second one, Clozaril, is difficult to use because it uh, can cause in 1% of people a drop in white blood cell count. So it requires weekly, at least early on, it requires weekly blood draws to make sure that the white count is not falling. Um, however, despite this difficulty in using the medication, it can be an extremely effective medication. And so if you fail the easier medication to use, the quetiapine, I will go to the, the clozapine and try that. Fortunately, there is a brand new medication that is going to be approved by the FDA imminently called Pimavanserin. This medication is an antipsychotic which does not use, does not block dopamine. It actually works with the serotonin system. Um, and so this is very, very exciting for the Parkinson's world because hopefully it will be a great way to control psychosis um, in Parkinson's disease without affecting motor function. And so that's um, soon to be available. That's just wonderful. We're going to have to close this now, and I'm afraid there's a dozen questions or more we have not got to, uh, but it's been a very rich uh, uh, session, and um, we don't want to leave these uh, good people stranded. So I do ask you, all of you who uh, have a pressing question we were not able to get to, to uh, call our, our hotline. We call it the Parkinson's Information Service. Telephone number is 1-800-457-6676. And the uh, the online um, connection is www.pdf.org. That's the Parkinson's Information Service, or PINS. Please call them. We have two terrific young women who run this, and they're sitting on the line as we talk. Uh, and they will be familiar with the question, I'm sure. And uh, if they don't have the answer themselves, they will get back and will be harassing poor Dr. Kilbert still further Absolutely. in traditional service to answer the questions. So thank you for this. I have two comments, uh, two notes that I will read almost verbatim as, as we close this and before I have a couple of quick PSAs before we, we close totally. One is from California, and the, co the comment is simply, thank you, excellent. And then a rather similar comment from the country of Colombia, uh, oh. where in, in perfect English, the person um, has indicated she's listening from the Parkinson's Foundation of Columbia. The information is simply great. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert, and thank you, PDF. So, of course, we're thrilled for that, too. Um, on the public service announcement score, I need to just um, uh, remind you, uh, to thank you and remind you uh, for completing the online survey. We do use these afterwards uh, in planning our programs for the future. And so, please, if you haven't already, answer the survey it should be on your screen at this time. Uh, please do so before you tune out. It helps us improve the webinars and also to get uh, um, the content planned for next year. I also want to repeat our thanks to our three uh, corporate sponsors, Abbey Inc., Acadia Pharmaceuticals, and Lundbeck LLC for providing the funds that made the entire series possible. Thank you for all uh, those three companies. Um, an archive of today's session will be available starting next week, Tuesday, November 17, at the PDF website, uh, www.pdf.org. Uh, we'll send you an email with a link when it's available so that you can listen to the talk again or let your friends know about it. So please take advantage of that. And just uh, advance billing for our next uh, event. Uh, it'll be on Tuesday, January 5, first week in January. 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time, as usual, and uh, it'll be on the topic of anxiety in PD. Um, our uh, speaker will be Dr. Joseph Friedman. Um, he's the director of the Movement Disorders Program at Butler Hospital and professor in chief of the Division of Movement uh, Disorders at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University in Rhode Island. So uh, he's a terrific doctor and a fine speaker, and I think he will not be disappointed, as certainly we have not been today with Dr. Gilbert. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gilbert, again for your brilliant and uh, clear presentation all the way through. Thank um, you I, so for much one, for benefited from this. I'm sure I'm one of hundreds um, who benefited from this. We're very grateful to you and uh, all of you. Um, we have a top team when it comes to these briefings. I think I can fairly say no one's sent us down yet for a briefing. Isn't that right, ladies? 
And uh, certainly today we've had one of the top team, and we're very grateful to her. Thanks, all of you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your fall season and uh, the holiday season because we're not uh, tuning in again till January 5. But we hope that you and others that you speak to about this take advantage of our January 5th um, session on uh, anxiety. And in the meantime, if you wish to call us for any reason about today or anything else that's on your mind, please use uh, those numbers that I gave you and check in with our helpline people, and we will be happy to um, to help you any way we can. Thanks a lot, Dr. Gilbert. Thanks to all of you, and have a very good week. Bye-bye.